59. Okay, right. I think we are live now. Um, yes. Okay. Okay. I think, yeah, it's now live on, on YouTube. Okay. okay. Good. Um, I just wait. Uh, let me drop some messages for. Okay. Okay, I think we can start now. Then uh, we have our people to join the session. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I'm Kende Salami. So today I'll be moderating today's session, and um, it's an uh, application for research positions, masters, PhD, and uh, postdoctoral uh, positions. And today I have with me um, our guest uh, speakers. Um, in person of uh, scholar Abayo Mimbankoli, and also uh, in absentia, we have uh, Abdullah Haborodi Tunde, which um, might also join us uh, at the end of the session. And um, but we get to learn everything they have for us today. And uh, I hope you you enjoyed the session. And um, please uh, st sit tight and um, till the end of the session. So uh, today we have uh, our agenda outlined. Uh, so first of all, uh, we have the HISF platforms. I'm uh, talking about some of our social media platforms. And uh, secondly, uh, there will be introduction of guest speakers. And thirdly, uh, uh, the speaker one part, which um, uh, in person of Scholar uh, Abayomi Bankole taking his own part. And uh, for the second part is uh, Abdullah's part, which uh we uh, the fourth item on the agenda then we have the q and a so for the q and a section we already have uh, some questions uh from um our members which they've already submitted over 40 questions of them and uh, we've kind of sprained the questions and um some of them will be the question that will be hard so for those joining us on uh, youtube you can always uh, also do, drop your own question so i hope you have uh, the luxury of the time to answer the questions on from the youtube uh, page as also so first of all um for hisf like we all know uh many of you are on hisf and uh for those that are not on hisf one way or the other you've uh, come in contact with some of uh, our materials and some of the resources from hisf so um we have a number of whatsapp groups and um we have some other sister groups like uh, asf frg groups and uh, so for the whatsapp group if you are interested in joining any of the hisf group you can always uh message any of the admin on any of these platforms that i'm sharing here now and so just drop a message or try to connect on any of these uh, social media. We also have on uh, YouTube, which we are currently using now to uh, broadcast uh, this webinar. And um, we also have on LinkedIn, we also have presence on LinkedIn. You can always message us and get updates with regards to the session. We have on Twitter, um, we also have presence on Twitter, which you can also get uh, messages. Uh, you can message the admins. You can get information, anything related to scholarships. You can also get that from um, from the Twitter page, also from Facebook. We also have that, and also we have a Google Drive, uh, which we put quite a number of resources that um, that um, concerns. Uh, scholarship in terms of SOP, in terms of CV, in terms of um, letter of recommendation, just to name as much as you want, and some um, past uh, four um, sessions that we've had in the past, we also have them on the, um, on the Google Drive, which you can always assess them. These uh, these um, PowerPoints will be shared in the description of the uh, uh, of the YouTube 
by the end of this session. So you can always go back and um, just click on it. And lastly, we have the website. So for our website, it's uh, an avenue we tend to bring all these resources that we have all together so that everyone on ISF, sister groups, and every other platform can come together and um, uh, kind of share information, share resources with, with one another and um, get to learn from each other. So um, you, you can also visit the website and the website is uh, www.hotspotsisf.com. You can always put that and uh, you can see uh, we have tons of resources on this platform, which you always uh, find interesting and um, which is very beneficial in your scholarship application. And so to the next on our agenda is uh, to the speaker and um, to our first speaker. Our first speaker is uh, Abayomi Bankole. Yeah, just let me say some of, of his profile. He has more than <laughs> then we have to uh, kind of <laughs> cut it short. So Abayomi Bankole is a young researcher and a lecturer at the Department of Water Resources Management and Agrometrology at FUNAB in Nigeria. And he earned wow. his uh, first and um, uh, second degree in the same department, um, but currently he's doing his second uh, master's uh, degree in civil and environmental engineering at Sao Paulo State University in Brazil. Uh, his research engagement uh, transverse the scope of water resource management and hydrology with a major focus on water and uh, waste treatment and implementation of machine learning. Yeah, and using machine learning in water treatment. That's really, uh, that's really nice. And uh, he's a fellow of the Agricultural Research and Innovation Fellowship for Africa. And um, he has also authored and um, co-authored several publications in his own field. And um, this is really remarkable. And his research net network cut across UK, Australia, Brazil, United States, among others. And um, he has also uh, had his own fair share of love letters, like or like rejection mails during flashy publications, and uh, and he is also a mentor. Of, uh, he has mentored quite a number of people, and during this scholarship publication, so you get to learn a lot from him during the session. And next to our second speaker, our second speaker is uh, Abdullahi Tunde Aborode. He's a PhD student in the Department of Chemistry, Mississippi State University, United States of America, and. Um, is currently working on structural characterization and genomic analysis of calcium protein sensing to determine what generates electric current uh, that signals the human heartbeat and heart failure. So working in uh, chemistry, art, um, medicine line kind of. So he's, uh, he has an interest in global public health, chemical biology, quality education and developmental issues affecting global south and um, he's an astute uh, scholar and um, he's uh, a global who uh, antibiotics guardian drug policy advocate and astute researcher with over 100 publications in scope of the journal let me repeat that again it's very interesting uh an astute researcher with over 100 uh and 100 uh, plus publication in Scope of Indus uh, Journal, so you know what is made of. And currently, is rated by Scopus as um, number 114 out of 500 top authors in Nigeria. And is also rated by Scopus by as the first author with the most COVID 19 papers in Nigeria. So that's really an interesting um, profile out there. So, you also get to learn uh, uh, his own part from his own part and then his experience um, during this session. So um, let's um, uh, let's hear from uh, our first speaker, uh, in person of our scholar Abayomi Bankole today. So you will be talking about research positions generally, uh, requirements for applications, uh, code emailing, how uh, you can craft CV for research positions. Um, how you, you can also go about writing letter of intent, motivation letter for research position. And briefly, <laughs> say some things about um, the some some of the points in the second speaker's uh, agenda. So it will also get some sort of interview with, with uh, supervisors, writing rules of uh, publication and how. So you get to learn a lot from it as well. Also, let's, um, so, um, scholar. 
Thank you. Uh, sorry. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, is uh, let me say good day so that uh, because I know we have people listening to us from uh, all the corners of the world. So once again, I am a bio me Luato Beloved Bankoli by name. Uh, just as has been earlier mentioned, I'll be delivering a talk on applications for research positions, strictly master's, PhD, and postdoctoral opportunities. So without much ado, uh, the table of content for today's lecture will go cut across uh, from the basic of uh, what are research positions and how we can assess research opportunities the requirements for the research position applications, uh, how do we make contacts for an advertised position, the structure of a reminder email and as well as a code email, uh, how to make contact, then we'll consider the components of a research post, a CV for a research position. Also, we'll look into the content of letter of intent or what we call motivation letter for a research position. So uh, by the uh, simplest form of introduction of what a research position means, is strictly an opportunity that are independently research-based. There is an opportunity for independent research uh, and it's focused strictly on research. Uh, they are basically called research intensive programs. Uh, these does not involve uh, Coursework's or uh, sometimes they involve some coursework, some level of coursework that can introduce uh, the students or the researcher into the art of scientific writing, the heart of that things that has to do necessary tools that the person needs to learn as or during the course of the research. So the examples involves uh, include MPhil, the Master of Philosophy. This is very common. This kind of degree is common in the UK, in the Australia as well. It's very common in, in Canada as well. Some institutions in Canada also do award these, as well as countries like Nigeria as well. Uh, these are research intensive programs. Uh, the candidates is, uh, is uh, focus is strictly based on research. And then we have uh, what we call master of research. These are award as well that at the end of the program, one can be awarded this degree, uh, this certificate. So we have master of research. By master of research, uh, just as it has been said, you've mastered research, research in certain scope, in certain field of study. So uh, this is common in, among some institutions, but uh, oftentimes the award generally comes from uh, research institute or from institutes that are under uh, you know some universities we have an example in uh, university of british columbia in canada uh, they have institute of research uh, resources environment and sustainability so they call it iris uh, so we have the likes of that that they offer mres certificates program uh, the, the, these uh, programs they are research intensive so then we also have what we call the general msc that people do see adverts for it if you look at the lower right hand side of the of the screen you see a a, a small caveat for uh mcgill university and then we see phd and msc openings at mcgill university these are positions that uh these kind of position they are not just the normal master's program the non-thesis-based master's program that people opt in for in places like the UK uh, and uh, some scholar, uh, some programs like uh, that is common to Canada. You know, we have all these one-year master's course program that you could just do and you get your master's. But these thesis-based master's program are intensive. They, some, for instance, they have the, uh, some of them comprise of two years or 18 months, but mostly it's common between 18 months and two years is the most common one, whereby you have one year dedicated to master's, I mean, to research program. All you think about, all you do is just research. 
uh, with, with some privilege. Uh, my first pro research program, a master's degree also is in that kind of line and as well as my current second program as well. So then we have doctor of philosophy with the PhD, the almighty PhD, you know, and then we have the postdoctoral research. Uh, even though right now, we, some of us, we would have seen a lot of things online, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, you know, the revolution that is actually happening to postdoctoral research. People are now saying, why should I be subjected to postdoctoral research before I can take up a professorship position, uh, a research position or a tenure track position? Uh, is it a must? You know, like uh, you are expected if you have a PhD, you are, you are expected to be a, a boss, a senior man as far as research is concerned. So the objective of a research program, they are generally defined from the beginning or when the applicants meet certain criteria after the admission. You, but before you are absorbed in, you would have discussed, you would have, uh, because the criteria for this kind of opportunity is that you have a project in view that you want to pursue, not that after the program that you will be subjected to just any kind of project that you have in mind. Uh, this, so the objectives are already defined. You would have had a professor in mind that you are working with, and then you are yourself, you already have a defined target. So the next one is how can I assess research opportunities? Because you know, one thing is knowing uh, that research opportunities exist. Another is how do one assess all these opportunities? We have a lot of platform, different avenues that one can enjoy these. So we have the university website or the research websites. Uh, we have profile pages. Uh, these, when we talk about university websites, university websites is, uh, you see University of, uh, Alabama, and then you visit the institution, you go through the department, you go through the degree criteria. Then the next thing you do is just to see, oh, what are the requirements? Oh, who is this professor that is working in this particular field? Such kind of thing, you, you, that is how you, you explore research opportunities. You will see a professor that will say, oh, this is my research lab. When you go through the, the professor's details, you see his research lab, the website link, you know, place there or the summary of his research engagement and his email. Then you go through the lab, you see. But another thing there is that when I say the, uh, uh, the researcher's website, there are some institutions that they have independent research websites aside from the professor's website. This is very common to... Uh, in some countries that they have a forum. Uh, the likes of in Canada, we have the Water Futures. Uh, this is also common in Hong Kong. I know they have the likes of Engineering Village and many other ones. In US as well, they have the AGU. They have several of such that through those websites, you can learn to, see, you can see different researchers from different institutions. Then through there, you can track them and then get contact with them. Then you know social media platform that has been the uh, in thing now. Uh, everybody, you go through LinkedIn, you go through Twitter, your WhatsApp platform like the ISF. So you get to see advert people sharing opportunities. Those who doesn't even need it or those who have flair for sharing, they will share. And then you get to know you have some prominent individuals that you can follow on all these social media platforms. Then they will share these opportunities. And then from there, you can take it up. Then we have scholarship forums and the website, such as our very own Hotspot ISF. Then we have scholarship positions. We have opportunity corners. We have opportunity for Africa's. Then we have research hubs. Uh, this is one of the least explored, the research hubs. For instance, if I tell someone that you can get access to opportunity on ResearchGate, you, you look at me like, <laughs> are you talking about me getting journal from ResearchGate? But if you search research gate very well, you can even set a, a notification email that you receive more uh, weekly emails from research gate on opportunities that are being posted by professors, researchers from across the globe. We have the likes of Science Direct as well. Science Direct also has a lot of opportunities for you know 
young uh, researchers as well. And then we have, for example, I put the one for UK here, job.ac.uk. On this platform, you get to filter both jobs, research positions as well. You know, you see a lot of adverts on that, then you'll be able to do your best, do your due diligence, apply for them. Then we have professional gatherings. You see, this is the least explored platform, the professional gatherings. We have luncheons, professors, they will just have a, a coffee gathering and then is they call it luncheon. Uh, it's just a gathering for researchers and students. So people share mind, somebody will give a talk to present what is research the research recent research engagement in his lab or in his or lab, you know, over time. And in the, some of them invite their graduate students to even give a talk to let people see what they have done and what they are doing. Uh, sometime uh, around two year 2020, I happened to, you know, attend a lot of luncheons. And then from there, I was able to see that some of the professors that have even been mailing, you know, that I may not even fit in well with their lab <laughs> based on, you know, what they are, you know, delivering the talk that they delivered. So we have conferences, we have webinars through professional associations. You know, uh, it's essential in young researchers you affiliate with a professional body. Uh, for instance, if you are in, uh, in water field, you should know the uh, International Water Association. That's the most common one. So everybody has, uh, you know, I mentioned the likes of AGU uh, in in the US. That's very common with the US. Uh, so different organization, I mean, different field of study has all these chartered institutes is very common in the UK. So, so the next one is, you will ask me then, uh, how do I, you know, meet up? Do I even know if I meet up or what are the essential requirements for all these opportunities? Trust me, there are a lot of opportunities, research-based opportunities. And uh, I'm telling you, I can attest to it. And I have folks that can even, you know, testify that yearly we have tons of thousands of people that benefit from research opportunities. So all you have to do is do your due diligence and look for it, explore all these routes that I've earlier mentioned. So the essential requirement is that you must have demonstrated research experience in the field of the advertised position. If you don't have this, trust me, you may not be considered for some of these opportunities because you are competing with folks from across the globe. When I say across the globe, I mean, you have to remember, we have Indians, we have Nigerians, <laughs> and then you have some other countries. And, you know, uh, you don't want to be like, uh, you You really want to impress the advisor or the, the supervisor, so to say, the PIs, you want to impress them, then you must have experience in use of relevant equipment or facilities or tools. Uh, for instance, you can't be applying for some for a position in geography, and then you don't even have an experience at all of unmanned vehicle. Uh, you don't even know what a drone is. <laughs> it's, it's not going to shock you. Or you 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 don't know AutoCAD, and you are an architect, or you are into electrical engineering, you know, and industrial engineering. And then you'll be chatting grid. Uh, it's essential that you have an idea. It's not that you must be a pro in all these things, but you must have an idea. You must know what it's all about. Uh, we, someone recently shared, you, you know, that uh, a, a folk uh, was at, uh, absorbed into a lab, and then the person said he knows how to use Python for artificial intelligence, and the person cannot even open a Python <laughs> software on the system. So that's how it can be. That's how hilarious it can be. But trust me, you don't want to experience that trauma. So the best thing you can do is, while you are sourcing for all those opportunities, you must give it your best. Explore wide what is requested of me. Whoa, 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 whoa. You must do your due diligence first. And then it's essential as well, you must have experience in scientific writing. When people say scientific writing, don't be scared. It's not that you must have like a scholar Abdullah that has over 100 publications, you know. It's not a must, but what we are saying is that you must have demonstrated this. You know, that's why that demonstrated is underlined. You must have demonstrated. You must be able to, to say it in a verifiable manner that, oh, 
this has been done. I have experience in this. So if we say you have experience in scientific writing, mind you, every graduate is expected to have an experience in scientific writing. So that undergraduate research project that you did is an evidence of scientific writing. So basic requirements on a norm, uh, you definitely have a uh, to submit either a cover letter or a statement of intent or a motivation letter. You know, you have to submit one. All of these, they are just given different acronyms. All that it has to do is tell us, you know, we'll still go into details about on, when we get to those aspects. So, and then you need a CV as well. You need a resume or a resume, but oftentimes I do advise people when you advise applying for an advertised position, get a CV, not a, a one page resume. You really want to show what you are made of. Though people do say that uh, I've seen a lot of folks that says, don't submit a CV that is more than four pages or that is more than three pages. But my friend, if your profile is heavy and is thick, we are talking about postdoctoral opportunities as well. You can't expect a postdoctoral researcher to be submitting for a, a three-page CV or a two-page CV. It's, you, you should be able to, uh, to tell us what, what you've done over the years. If you are going for postdoc, it means you've had, you've invested minimum 10 years of your lifetime into, you know, both studying and research. Scholarly works, you, at least you must have had a BSc and then you must have had a, a, a PhD uh, for those that did not even have uh, an MSc. You know, why some have, could even have like six, uh, I mean, two, three master's certificates. So you have invested time. All those time that you've said you've invested, how can you prove it to us that you are an independent researcher? So you should have a profile that is solid enough. So if you have it, fine. If you don't have, don't think less of yourself. You still have something to offer. All you need is our passion, that willingness to pursue all these opportunities we are talking about. So definitely you need a transcript. The transcript is the summary of the courses that you've done over time. That is how the person will be able to see, oh, you said you have an experience in, uh, uh, in biosensor, you know, what course did you even take that even show that you have experience in biosensor? You see, the when you don't have enough research experience, the transcript can bail you out, particularly when the field is, you know, in direct line with what you're applying for. So then you need to show, of course, the certificates that will prove that you've uh, you know, you've uh, excelled in that field, you've successfully conducted the program. I remember in year 2020, a professor uh, couldn't consider me for an opportunity because uh, I was on, I, I haven't finished my program that time. So you should be able to present a certificate. Some institution will tell you by August 31st, failure to present the certificate means you won't be able to proceed on the program. So that is why some of us that we are still on a program, we may not be able to benefit from certain position or the other because that position they are talking about has some timeline as well for the delivery of the work. Then evidence, other requirements, you know, you may need test score, you may need publication, you may need writing sample. Talk of publication, one of the places that has a lot of opportunities for research work, but people from Africa in particular, we hardly explore these opportunities, Australia. And that country is very rich in terms of research engagement. But the problem is that to get acceptance into, you know, an MPhil program or a PhD program in Australia, you must have a good track record of uh, research profile. You know, your, your research profile must be solid. I remember uh, that was 2020. My a professor, my one of my uh, the professors that I had interest in me then back then, he said to me point blank, "Oh, I've reviewed your profile. You are good. I'd love to have you on my on my team for this particular research, but you need to have a Q1 journal." That was when I get to know about what is called a Q1 journal, and trust me, uh, that is how it goes. You need to have all these experience. So, for instance, some institutions in 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 the US, uh, they will definitely require a test score, GRE or TOEFL for that advertised position. So how do you make contact? The first thing is you, you definitely have to hit that contact. You have to initiate it. 
someone you've not talked to and then you are murmuring in your room, in your bedroom, oh, I need this opportunity. I must get this opportunity. And you didn't contact the advisor. How do you know the person is even, you know, that you exist? So you have to, first of all, initiate a contact with the person. So code emailing, you know, you have to send code email. A lot of research, uh, you know, people have shared several opportunities on, I mean, several samples of all these code emailing and then the acquiry email. But the summary of it is that you should just be able to say to the person, just in a summary layman terms, what impress you about the person's research? What has been your own past or current research engagement? And then what you intend to do for the ones that you are just initiating the uh, interaction with the PI. But if it is an advertised position, is already advertised. The person already said, this is what I want to do in my lab. Is study based on hepatitis B. Is study based on a man vehicle, climate change. Then definitely you can see such advert on climate change and then you are telling the person that I want to see, I want to see how ruminant animals operate. Of course, it doesn't go well. So you are, so in such instances, what you are sending is an inquiry email or you are just sub making a submission of your own interest. So it's still a code email. But for an advertised position, you don't need an elaborate talk because you are submitting the entire document required for the profile for the advertised position. So in that instance, the professor must have mentioned, send your letter of intent, send your cover letter, send your transcript send your cv the person would have given out strict instruction so it's not all of them that ask for certificate sample of certificate no some will just say just send your cv and transcript some will say send everything with your test score and every other thing so it depends it's not fixed but all i have to say is make sure you have the required documents ready so you must send you send the required documents highlighted in the research ad advice, advert. So you must send it. And then different advice has different medium. It's not all of them that has uh, that you have to send code email. Some of them, they already have a designated website, Google form, that you just have to fill, answer the essay questions in that form, and then you get it done. So you need to read through the instruction, get the facts, know the process to apply, how to apply, and then go through that process of to apply. The reason is, if a professor said, apply via this link, and then you copy the professor's email, and then you send him an email to that person. Imagine the number of graduate students that is in the whole world. Imagine all of them graduate of your institution. Imagine all of them, you know, mailing you and telling you that, oh, you have to consider me for this opportunity. So the professor may not have the privilege to respond to all email. And then the professor will definitely look that, oh, you've not done your due diligence. You've not checked through the advert. You should have been able to see, you should have seen the uh, link where you can apply for the opportunity. Then the structure of a reminder email, because sometimes we send code email and then we don't get feedback. And the next thing that will happen is, oh, how do you follow up? Or sometimes we send e code email, we get a feedback, but we don't maintain the relationship. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I remember when I started hunting for scholarship opportunities, and then I mailed a professor in University of British Columbia. And that professor was so kind to the extent that we discussed about the research proposal and everything immediately. But I failed to contact the person after some couple of months. So by the time it gets to like three, four months, I was just like disturbed. How do I mail this person? How do I mail this person? I couldn't get a way around it until the day I, you know, some of courage, you know, and then I sent the email to the person and the person still remembered. We continue with the conversation. So what you have to do is it, you have to keep it short and you might keep it very simple because you sent an email earlier that detailed everything that contains the whole detail. So this time around, you just want to send a reminder. It's a subtle reminder, like I usually say. So you read, introduce yourself. You can't assume that the professor will still remember your name or where you come from. So I am X, Y, a graduate of so, 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 so. 
you know then you use a simple and friendly opening statement oh i understand you be, you are very busy with research engagements but i'm just sending this email uh, a sub a subtle remind as a subtle reminder regarding my interest in your lab it's very simple and then once again attach your cv or your resume because when you send the email and then you don't attach it the professor may not have the time so when you said when you said you send an email before and then you said find attach a copy of my cv of course i don't need to be going back to your previous email before i check your for your cv i just check your cv and then see oh i can accommodate this kind of student i can accommodate this kind of student so the don'ts of this is that you must not write a long essay again this is an email keep it very short keep it very simple professors are busy if graduate student can be forming busy for you then you you can imagine how much more a professor that is supervising that person and then supervising like 5 10 or 12 or 15 of such people so you should expect them to be busy as well but at the same time i do say this to people if a professor cannot honor your email i i know of a professor that responded to my email after like i think like three to four months and he explained oh i've been very busy sorry so you should know when you are working with the person as well how the you know interaction or the conversation is going to be like so do not write a long essay do not exercise emphasize your research prowess or expertise again the reason is because it's a subtle reminder but when you are writing the initial one you are expected to you know emphasize your research prowess or your research experience but also not too lengthy but you have to keep it concise and well presented so do not send multiple emails within a short time for instance you send an email on monday and the professor did not reply you tuesday wednesday thursday and then you send another email on thursday again you know it's not bad if you do that but i do advise give the person an average of one week especially for those that some of them that they, they are very busy or they are away from office they will include uh, what we called an auto response and then the auto response will tell you if it is very urgent tap through i mean include urgent in the email if it is not very urgent you know i will respond to you later so that's how it goes you must you must keep it in mind you don't want to uh like disturb the person too much so that the person will not feel like why are you disturbing me are you begging me for this position of course you don't have to beg because you're a graduate student you are going to work for the money that they are going to pay you and then they are paying you to do the job so you are also delivering service so let's go on so the component of a cv for research position <laughs> we've seen a lot of uh, cv template online uh unfortunately i couldn't include some platform where you can score your cv here but you can score your cv online via resume worded you can score your cv via ref score and many other platforms like that they are ai based platform that will go through your cv and then tell you oh this is missing this is not missing but it still can be like when you sit down and then you carefully craft that cv and you give it to one or two of your friends or someone that is ahead of you to also peruse it and tell you, oh, this is okay, this is not okay. You know, I remember uh, I, at some point I had to call on scholar, I uh, tell them, oh, let's look into this. Uh, how do we, you know, revamp this entire CV? So the sem the summary of it is that you have to confirm if they have a specific CV template. If it's if they don't have, then you can use another one. But when they have for instance, when you're applying to a, 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 an opening advertised position in the in the Europe, they might require you to use, you know, Europa CV or you are applying to Germany, for instance. You know, they have their own template. And so it's different. One thing there is that CV for different positions, you know, except if it is exactly same advertise similar field, you know, a similar form of research that you are engaging your cv you are expected to you know adjust one thing or the other in that cv so perhaps the reason why you've not been you know having some good feedback is all this so we'll go through the details now so the general indicator is that you know you have to include only post secondary information the minimum should be maybe your national diploma 
or your degree, you know, whether you're applying for a postdoctoral opportunity as well, or PhD or master's, you know. Excuse me. And then you have to also include information on your previous research engagement. When you include all this information, the essence is just for them to go through the CV. The, the CV should be the in thing. Your CV should be the point where this professor will be convinced. Even before the person gets to your SOP, your CV, the person should be able to see your CV and say, oh, this person aligned well. I'm not talking about you having a 20 page CV. I'm just talking about itemizing the key information that the PI will be interested in. All relevant information should be properly detailed in that CV. Forget all those lamba that you don't have to, you know, uh, your CV should just be strictly two pages. Then where are you supposed to mention you are applying for a, 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 a position that talk on coastal, you know, a recession or, you know, anything that has to do with coastal environments. And then that research that you did that involved coastal environment, you did not mention it. Of course, you are shooting yourself in the leg. So if it is because of that space, you should be able to, you know, put it there, put it somewhere, project, thesis, dissertation that you did, mention it. Additional research engagement, mention it. The reason why you have to mention it is because the professor will not have the opportunity to contact you and say, come and explain yourself to me if you really have this experience. Before it will get to the level of interview, you must have been able to showcase something in your CV where the, that the professor will say, you know, so that is how it goes. Then you have to include, you know, you have to check your area of interest. For instance, when you list your area of interest, for someone like me, my first area of interest, health-based water-related studies. Second one, water and wastewater treatments. Third one, artificial intelligence adoption you know, in, implementation in water treatment. And then I'm now applying for a, a position that deals with climate change. And all the research interests that I mentioned never have anything that has to do with climate change. My friend, no professor will even look at me that as, if, as a serious person himself because you've already said your interest. And then when you mention your interest, it has nothing in any way to, you know, to even correspond with what the advertised position is all about. So you, are, you can't even expect to get a response from such person. Because when I see such person, as even as a, if I'm the PI, I'll just dump it somewhere straight. So you should be able to highlight your research area of interest or research interest. So the next thing that you have to do is use appropriate editing you know your teaching experience your working experience all your working experience is teaching 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 you are applying to a professor in the us for assistantship you should be able to put it your working experience you can even put it work slash teaching experience you know you work a lot in the laboratory you know after working experience you can create a caveat laboratory experience see the summary of this is that if you check 50 CV of different research of different researchers, you will see it. What we just correspond is that each one of them place each aspect, you know, that we showcase them under a particular theme that we think. It's not that maybe there is a particular way you, that you have to do it, though there are sequence that it has to follow, of course. After your name of course you have to showcase your degree after and then i would have loved to showcase more uh, i mean to show us a sample here but uh to avoid people plagiarizing all these writing sample that's the reason why we i decided you know to drop them so you have to use appropriate editing research experience laboratory experience where you have to technical skills you have to detail it you are applying for a, a for a research position that says you must know how to use Python, you must know how to do big data analytics, you must know how to use particular tool. And then in your CV, there's no place where you mention technical skills. Of course, my friend, you can't even be considered because they look at you that this one does not even have experience. Because what you fail to do, some others, they will do much more than that. So you have to you know, do your due diligence and give it the best. Then you have to include research related information. That's why I said it, you know, technical skills, laboratory experience, you are in chemistry, and then you are applying, 
you, you know, you've worked with uh, AAS machine, you've worked with spectrophotometer, you've worked with uh, UV light uh, radiation, and so many things like that. You're applying for air quality assessment, for instance, or you're applying for computer vision, and then you don't know image segmentation, you, or you know it, and then you did not mention it. Of course, you, nobody will even look at you or your site. So you have to include all this information in your CV. Include them so that tomorrow you will not come back and then you see be, you'll be regretting that, ah, could it be that I did not include this? By the time you see the CV of others, you know, you, ju you should do your due diligence and then you should try your best to include all this information. Then you ensure to include referee details. See, this is what is there. People will tell you that your CV should carry under referee. It should be under uh, available on request. You are applying for a research position, an advertised position, and that professor mentioned uh, in the criteria two referees. My friend, when you see two referees or three referees, what they are saying is that include that, send us the information of those details, of those referees. This is not a job advert that you be you tell them the HR that's available on request when you get back to me. This is an advertised position. See, this is how it happens. Some of these PIs, they will not even ask for the reference data from the referee. What they want to see is the referee is expected to be someone that you have passed through or that you have come in contact with, a lab that you have been passed through, you know, a supervisor or somebody that, that have supervised you, maybe for your bachelor's degree what some of them does is this for those that are even particularly those that are really interested in someone that is vast they will go to maybe science direct or research gates type it on google type the name of your referee on google when google brings it they will check you can imagine for instance you are telling me you've published 50 publications you have 50 publications and then you said this is my supervisor that mentor me and in that sop you even mentioned the name of that person and then i went to check the profile of that name that you mentioned in your referee letter and then i saw that the person only has one publication on research gates <laughs> you should expect me to make some decisions based on that alone the reason is because you see we pis supervisors they are human beings and then they have their own characters, they have their own attributes. So individual, each of them, they act based on their own experience. So you should expect that the information you are supplying, particularly now that PIs, they are already aware that some graduate students, they will even be the one to even fill their form or to you know send the information by themselves. So that is why some of them even tell you, send the the PI, the referee email must be the official email. The reason why they are saying all those things is to avoid, you know, people cutting corners. So you have to do your due diligence, ensure that you include all those information, include the referee details in that CV. When you are sending another CV that is just barcode email or any other thing, you can choose not to. But mind you, when you have a good researcher or a good uh the professor as your referee maybe the person is well known in that field and then you refuse to even include the person's detail my friend you are just even shortchanging yourself because if you include the person's detail you don't even know maybe that person has listened to your uh, advice or i mean to your referees uh you know lecture maybe at one conference or the other and then the person will just remember that oh I know this person. Of course, you can't include in your CV that it's about instinct that trained you, <laughs> you know, and then you expect someone that saw it and then that shares it so much and not, you know, refer the person. So that's how it works. You should include it. You are expected, you know, to do all those kind of things. So then professional services, you should include it. Development oriented engagement, include them because these are the things. Because, for instance, you are a journal reviewer. Uh, and then you refuse to include it. That uh, I review for journal. The fact that you can mention that you review for you review for journals that shows that you know what it takes when it comes to scientific writing. You know, so all these informations are very essential. I'm taking my time to you know give these details so that we will be able to know what is expected of us. Trust me, when you know your onions, you have to, you you won't even be bothered. You won't be tossed here and there. Rejection will not even mean anything to you. So then 
the content of letter of intent. You know, I've seen a lot of uh, scholar Kenny, you know, he has been dealt with it before in, in the previous lecture. You have to use the star approach. You have to use the car approach. See, all I just want to tell you is the summary of all those car approach, star approach is all these. You just express your interest in the whole thing. And that's through the problem statement. You already know the advert. For instance, if it is a cover letter, so you have to express your interest at the opening statement, the first paragraph, we express your interest. And then the next thing you have to do, you have to talk about your relevant experience, whether it's working experience, research experience, lab, uh, leadership experience, anything. For instance, a research that is multidisciplinary, you can't expect them not to look for somebody that has good charisma, good uh, uh, in, uh, human relations. You can't expect me to uh, to employ a student that you know never even want to have anything to do with somebody else before. Or maybe, for instance, even if you said you have publication, and then I notice all your publication, you are the sole author of maybe all the five publications. I will ask myself, can this person interact with people? Why is it this person not even has any researcher in mind to work with? So then the next thing is you discuss the uniqueness of your past research experience. The uniqueness is what we sell you. It's not the grammar, it's the uniqueness. If you like, use grammar for a simple lay English. If the professor did not understand, Google is there, the person will type it on Google. What is the meaning of this? The ultimate thing there is the uniqueness of your research engagement. What have you done that is different? Discuss why you are the best fit for the advertised position. You can mention it's required of you to have the likes of uh, experience in coding, experience in big data analytics, drone pilot, and the like. Then, and you, you've, you know, you've also with one um, under one firm and the other, you know, where you use some man vehicle, where you use this and that. Mention those things in detail and in creative manner. The reason is you can't just say, I have used drone, I have used. Uh, AutoCAD, I have used this. When you just mentioned you have used, you have used, you have used, what are, the, what are those things that you use those things to do? You know, what are the quantifiable proof? You should be able to have proof. In some institutions, they will tell you, you know, attach the proof of all those you're writing samples. So all those things you mentioned in your SOP, you attach all the certificates, you know, you attend a conference, all the conference certificates, you must attach them. You know, Sorry, brother, so that's you... to show you. Um, yes. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry to cut you short. Um, just to remind you, we have about twelve minutes left on your part. Yes, I'm almost Thank done. You. I'm almost yeah. done, sir. So that is how it goes. Uh, and then you give additional information about why you are interested in the lab, and then you discuss about how you intend to utilize the opportunity. Is mentioned is is crucial when you uh, when, you know for you to mention this, even though it's not important. But if you mention it, is a big clause for you when you mention it to them that oh through this opportunity you know beyond just gaining job as a professor in the future i hope to do this i hope to engage this particular thing i hope to contribute to this particular professional body i hope to do this it's very essential and then the last thing that you need to really do is you have to avoid generic and fake you have to avoid generic statement or you know you just utter a vague statement in your in your sop or i mean your motivation letter or your letter of intent you can't afford to do that then you have to maintain a synergy you see what i do is to pen down each section of my essay i will pen it down and then i'll think it through carefully itemize all the key things i want to mention how the idea is dropped, the moment the idea drop, you mention it. The moment the idea drop, you pen it down. Then you now create a connection for all the paragraphs. Even though you are talking about uh, one paragraph is to talk about problem statement, the other is to talk about, uh, uh, how do I put this? Uh, the next one is to talk about your working experience or your research experience. There must be a link between the first paragraph, the second paragraph, the third and the fourth paragraph. There should be a link in them, but so that by the time you mention, you've mentioned something in one paragraph earlier, 
So the next paragraph is to deal with that thing. Then you go in details in that one. Then the next paragraph will go in details. So that is how to maintain synergy. So it will flow. When I'm reading it, I'll be impressed. I really want to know. Or when I'm reading it, I'm asking myself, how about this question? This person failed to you know, include this information. The immediately, you know, you mention it there that, oh, yes, this is how it goes. Uh, this is how I did this. This is what this was able to achieve. Then the person will be impressed that, oh, wow. Yeah, that shows that this one is really vast as far as academic writing is concerned. Then don't only quantify your experience. You said you have five publications. Mention the quality of those paper. Key ones that are related to that research positions. What are those things, you know, that that particular papers, you know, address? What are the particular article, uh, the, what are the problems? What problems does the particular articles, you know, solved or the solution provide? Then you have to present your most relevant and quality work. Trust me. When you have, for instance, I have five paper publications, two or out of them, they are international journals, you know, Scopus Index, well, you know, uh, you know, cited. And then I'm now, I now choose to mention the one that I publish in uh, Nigeria Society of Science or Indian Journal of uh, Environmental Sciences. Of course, it's not that they are bad, but you should mention the one that has more weight because some peers, they will even go back, they will check your publication. What's the quality of the paper? That's why they ask for a written sample. So then the next one is that you don't beg PIs. Yeah, you, you can't be writing beggarly. Even though there are ways that we use emotional statements, but you can't be writing beggarly. You just have to you know carefully structure your statement. Use emotional statement, but be careful with it. Then another thing is that you don't have to be too boastful. Where you are saying, uh, you know, all those grammar, and then you jam pack all of them together, and then you said this astute researcher that is erudite in uh, this, you know, is not all about that. It's not about the grammar. It's about the profile, and then what can you know strike the interest of the of the researcher. You should be able to just strike the interest of the PI that oh yes, this student should be able to do this. So that is how it goes, and then. Additional tips that I would like to give is that someone will ask me, what is the role of publication in this? My friend, publication is very essential, but that's your BSc thesis, the, your BSc project is also an example, is an evidence that you can present for those that will be applying for MPhil. Now, you may ask me, if this is very common. If you have a first class, I will advise you, look towards Australia, you should be able to get quality, you know, uh, research. MPhil is qualified in, in Australia, particularly if you have some evidence of, uh, uh, you know, uh, research and experience, you know, the, the criteria is you should have a, uh, though some of them, they will say the criteria for MPhil is similar to that of PhD. It's essential, but you should be able to showcase yourself. Then what are the websites? I've shared the website. Then uh, how to be a good researcher. How to be a good researcher is in two forms. Number one is that you have to be able to commit yourself to research. One, reading. Two, engaging researchers. Three is writing. When you read, you engage, and then you don't write. Yeah, there won't be anything to show that you are a researcher. But when you are writing, when you are able to put into practice what you have learned over time, you know, my most referred, uh, one of my referred mentor, you know, Professor Edmond, he, he will tell you, uh, I have to publish my paper in quality journal. Not that you publish your work in predatory journal. You can publish in predatory journal and then you come and tell us that you are, a, you know, an astute researcher. <laughs> Trust me, or a scholar, they will look at you that, you that you just published in a predatory journal and then you are calling yourself a, a you know a researcher that is vast of course it shows you don't even know your onions so you should be able perhaps maybe some another time i may be able to deal with the indicators of you know the right journals but trust me those are in the key indicators and then the the general hints how you make a successful research application do your due diligence package it using all these informations we've talked about. And then when you package everything, make sure you apply. Don't just say, oh, it's that minute, I can't apply again. No, you must 
apply when you don't apply see people that doesn't even know anything like it up to what you know they will get the scholarship and then you will still be on that same spot so when you don't apply you can't win it's those who apply that they get selected you know so it's those who uh then the when you are talking about interview some research positions will require you to have you know to do interview with them uh when you want to do interview you, you don't need too much two things that they really want to see is your confidence to prove that those things you mentioned you actually did those things then the second thing they want to really see your presentation how can you present yourself can you comport yourself can you present yourself in a lay terms can you introduce yourself those are the key things aside from the fact that the person will really want to see that this person is a real person and not a robot you know those key indicators particularly those two things are the major things they want to see when you comport yourself you 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 know for a professor to have actually asked you for an interview it means you stand a chance so all you have to do is just to convince the person and demonstrate it that yes you have what it takes so based on that i i i strongly advise you to give it your best prepare yourself when you if you want to learn about how to you know attend interview attend to interview questions there are a lot of you uh, informations on youtube that you can get to know there are a lot of information on twitter on linkedin you can get to know about all of them and then all you have to do is do your due diligence graduate school is very tasking it's you know it requires a lot of from you so when you're writing that i can work under pressure by the time that professor is a research position you know even for a postdoctoral researcher you are working in the lab it's expected of you you will stay in the lab all day all night and then all around the year for some if it is phd you can't expect you'll be doing an experimental work for phd that will be less than one year it's not possible out of that four years you two should think it twice why we should pay you to spend two weeks in the in the lab and then the remaining uh, the remaining three years plus you spend it you know eating uh, and gallivanting and enjoying yourself no you really want to see you to produce you know you must have something to show for this particular thing because you are being paid to do this job so you have to deliver so for you to deliver you have to prepare yourself ahead prepare yourself ahead is essential every field has its own tools that they use every field has its own requirements you should look at them get to know them in case you like one particular field you want to even cross to another field go to that field search for professors website just search and see what are those things that those professors are even doing and then from there you launch into it and then give it a check give it a try before you know it you become a pro in that field trust me it costs nothing than just only perseverance endurance and then putting what you have learned into work i wish you all the best and i hope i've been able to you know share one thing or the other for us thank you very much Thank you very much for in fact you've been more than <laughs> you actually delivered a lot to us and uh, it was really an impactful one. If I probably at the end of this session, I just have to send one or two code emails, you know. Yeah, it's it's was really an impactful one. Yeah. And um that was so thank you for that. And so we uh go to the next speaker's part. So but before that, um, uh, so for the second speaker, we have um, he, we have some. Uh, um, so we have. So just to say that uh, it was quite unfortunate that he couldn't uh, join us now. But he had sent uh, a recorded uh, version of his own part also, just to add some things to what uh, scholar Idospec has also said. So uh, which uh, I'll also be sharing with everyone. Yeah. So one of the first things that we have on agenda is interview with a potential supervisor, your do and don't. So what are the do and don't? And why do you have, you know, why are you, you know, <clears throat> why do you have do and don't in, 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 in an interview? And why did your professor have to interview you? Yeah, you know, a lot of people will have, you know, mail a lot of roughs and like, oh, they didn't reply my mail and blah, blah, like that, you know. Yeah, a lot of, Professors are busy, you know, trying to reply mail, 
but, but for a professor to interview, that really is so, something, so a potential that is different from other applicants. Take note of that. He saw a potential that is different from other applicants. So he's using an interview as a measure to establish the potential that you said you have. And during the interview, you will, you will establish that potential through the stability and the way you express yourself. So that is why we have do and do. Your do part in the interview section is you have to be confident. Yeah, whatsoever you're saying must be so confident. You must be calm and you must be concise in, you know, in, in, you know, in the way you 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 give out your point. You must be clear. You must be confident, and you must be, you know, you must be also be encouraged. You must be also be engaging. You must be engaging in the sense that what you are saying must be relatable. Like you are saying something that are feasible. So you must not be late for your interview. Don't be late for your interview. Then one of the things that I will say, which is the basic thing, is that you have to be prepared. Preparation. A prof is scheduling an interview with you. Have you read about his project? That is number one. <clears throat> what is on his project? You know, which project did, does it interest you? Then how can you establish that project? How does that project relate with you? How does the project motivate you? Like, what are the motivations that let you love the project? You must be able to say something that must tell you a story that must be able to link to a project that, that is of a great interest because that is when it's going to see the, the real motivation in you that you have something that push you to come to his lab, that make you, that make you come to his lab rather than any other people lab. So that alone do create trust because they know that you know what you're doing. And you must be able to showcase your knowledge specificity towards the project. What are your skills? Showcase that you have these also skills. And not only showcasing that you have the skills, you showcase it with reference, evidence. So I have skills on bioinformatics. This skills on environment, I was able to publish this. So even if you are not able to publish, no, I was able to train people. You get, even if you are not able to train people, I was able to work in this place with these skills. So you must be able to showcase your expertise or reference, your expertise or, you know, skills based on your reference, like what have you done? You know, what have you done so far? You must be able to do that. And one of the, one another thing entirely that you must be able to do is that you don't lie. You have to be real. What you don't know is what you don't know. Don't lie. This is one of the things that a lot of people do, you know, when you say, oh, I've operated an MR before, and when they find out that how many MR do I even have in Nigeria, and they find out that we do not have much NMR, you see, how do you not learn your own NMR? So you don't, what you don't have expert of, don't lie about it. They even showcase people that are read and people that are not read, because when you go, when you get to the lab, they believe that you know it, and they push you to the, they push you to the table to, con to start working, and they find out that you are, you are not working. Like, you don't have that energy to work because you are not producing results because you don't know what you are doing. Yeah, so don't lie. Be real. What you don't know is what you don't know. If it's going to come to you, it's going to come to you. The professor knows what he's looking for. And because you have what he's looking for, that's why he grants you an interview. So you have to do your own work. Another, another thing entirely is that you have to be... Uh, you. <clears throat> You don't have to criticize or give feedback. What is the current project that they doing? Do you have an idea about a new project you can bring into the lab that can is, that can boost more that can boost more value to the work they are doing? You don't say, oh, the 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 project you are currently working is rubbish, this and that. No, you don't criticize people project or people that have done the project and left the lab or they have left the the professor places you don't criticize you have to give feedback constructive feedback the other thing is that ask smart answers a uh, questions rather ask smart question at the end of your interview questions that the professor be, will think deeply before he can answer it smart question and that can link to how prepared you are you don't have to be nervous speak as if you are talking to your your siblings like speak with confidence 
they, that is what you see. They want to see the confidence. You even if you know everything, but you become nervous. You you might skip a lot of things that you might not see, and that can go your interview. One of the things that you don't need to do during interview is that I've said it. You don't have to lie. Number two is that if you don't know a question, you don't parambulate towards that question. You leave the question as it is, like, oh, I don't have any idea. Then I'm going to walk towards it and give you feedback later. Then don't see generic question as, you know, as normal depth question. Like, give a generic question, the vivid information you are going to give specific question. Another thing entirely is that you have to, you know, you, you, you have to avoid yes or no answer. Like, do you do this? Yes. Give that answer. When they say yes, I did this and this and this and this. So to haste your interview, be prepared, be, be engaging, show realistic points, things that are feasible. Don't lie. Be real to yourself. Give in full information about about the the uh the lab. Another thing entirely that I remember to do is that build on on your point. You said the point again. Don't be repetitive in your point. Be building up on your point as you are saying it. That will showcase that you have the full information about the details. I'll make an example about something that happened to me here before I jump to the next uh the next um the next uh. A point or the next agenda outline in lecture is that when when I come here um, in Mississippi State University and then um, you know the lab that I wanted to join you know I know the professor and the professor said he's out of the country that when he's back we should have a meeting so when he come back uh, I have read my part everything I've prepared because preparation we do is it do allow you to ease your interview if you don't prepare you have tough time to deal with your interview. So I've already read everything, all the details, map out projects that they can even work on, you know, we design things, you know, break down what they are doing, you know, ask questions about what they're doing. Look at another approach they can look into. So I, I interviewed with the man and the man who said, oh, I tell him about his story, why I want to join his lab because I lost my brother due to heart failure. He died due to heart failure and, you know, he's working on, you know, using mm -hmm calcium sensing protein to 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 modify you know or, or to generate electric current that that can boost or regenerate at failure so he, he said oh <clears throat> he's looking for more physical guys who that can do calculation and uh, and the likes like that so he said it's not going to you know take me but i will send a message about my idea for his lab then the next thing is that within 20 minutes, send a message, come to my lab now. Things about people, about an interview is that you have to showcase your strength, all your strength and your expertise. It's also part of it. They don't know you. So you don't tell them about your strength and your expertise. Who, do, who, who else want to know about you? Say yourself. This is an interview. But when you are selling yourself, say yourself with, with caution. How do you want to say yourself? You don't say, I just know how to, I know how to do genomic analysis. What are the reference about what you know how to do? So I'm currently working in, uh, in uh, international genomic analysis of this also place, or I'm going to be a lecturer in this also place. So you have to know what you want and you have to build on it. So I will leave the interview part. So the next thing is writing a proposal. Yeah, writing a proposal is simple, but what I do tell people is that are you writing a proposal over your specific research interest? So when you are writing a proposal on your specific research interest, one of the things that I do not tell you is that, do you have knowledge in what or in the area you want to write about? What are your knowledge? You have to know where your knowledge lies, where your expertise lies in the field. When you know that and you have full details that you are well assured that you have a full knowledge in this field, the next thing that will follow is that, have you mapped out any problem in this field? What are the problems in your field of interest? You have to note that. You have to note the problems. Noting out the problem will not give you a super head about how you are going to recreate a topic that will tally to a problem. Because a research proposal is about two things. 
Is he solving a problem or is he establishing that a problem is a problem? So when you know that, okay, your research wants to solve a problem, what is the problem statement? Is there any study that have established that this is a problem? Are you getting me? What is the scope? Sorry to cut you short. Right. We have uh, about 12 minutes left. All right, I will, I will, I will fast. Yeah. Thank you. So you have to know that what literatures have established that this is a problem, what uh, what scopes that surround this problem? Have you justified that this is a problem? You do justification of the study. Then what hypothesis do you have that make you believe that this is a problem? Then what are the research questions? What are you trying to answer? What is your aim and objective of the research? What is your methodology? What is the methodology you're trying to use? What is the approach you are trying to use? Are those approach unique? Have anybody used the approach before? What is novel about your approach? What is novel about the techniques you want to use? Then what is your proposed conclusion? Is there limitations to your study? Is there a recommendation for this study? So these are the major things that you need to know about writing a proposal and how to win a proposal. Then after you have done that, find a mentor that can, that in that field, they have won several grant or they have, they have write several research proposals to proofread and edit. Then the next thing on slide is the role of publication in getting a research position. The role of publication play a very major, major important, you know, contribution to getting a research, a research position because number one thing is that it makes you more competitive. That is number one. It, it give your employer, you know, those that want to employ you, an idea about your experience, about how successful you are in your field. Are you getting me? How knowledgeable you are in your field and how you can handle problems and how also you are an independent thinker. So it plays a major role, major role to getting a research, um, a research position. Then what are the website or sources? I'll just break the website or sources of getting a research, uh, a research position. Number one is, is uh, social media like Twitter or LinkedIn, uh, departmental website, uh, university, and then we have the other thing entirely is that we have um, uh, <clears throat> university and we also have uh, industry. Yes, industry. So industry links. Then how do you become a good researcher? To become a good researcher is a process. Then what I will say about that is that you have to learn about research. When you learn about research, you keep working on that research. You get results, you find a mentor, you know your specified feed, then you keep working on that feed. Then, and the last thing is that you need to know how to make a successful application is that read the application very well. Prepare your application document. So, see that you are qualified for that position. Let people review the application for you. Pray and God will do the best. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, let me know. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, um, Scholar Abayomi. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, so we uh, so we've heard from uh, our second speaker, which uh, in person of Abdullah Tunde Abarode. So like I said, he's unable to uh, continue the session with us. So that's why uh, we had to <clears throat> we had to let him go. So to the um, to the last um, part of the session which is the key and but before that uh, i just want to say that the uh, the uh, the presentation the powerpoint from uh the speaker and the one i'm currently using now will be uh, attached to the uh, video description on the youtube channel so you can always have access to them which, so you have that as reference probably between your application you can refer to them and also rewatch the video on uh, the youtube um um, YouTube channel also. So uh, to the next on our agenda is the Q&A session, which uh, we already have over 28 questions, I guess. So it's going to a biome will be helping us answer some of, uh, hopefully we answer that before time runs out. So um, so if you have other questions, you can still put them on, the, ask them through the um through the youtube uh, question and answer uh, through the youtube comment section so we can always get that so if you have more time we will 
you surely pick uh, your questions from there. So, but, but before that, let's start with the ones we have already. So, um, so I'll buy, I mean, I hope you're with me. It's going to be a long time. Yes, I'm with you. <laughs> okay. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, so please I'm let's uh, ask us to be very concise as possible uh, because we have, uh, we have quite a number of them and there are some that need okay. a bit of explanation as compared to other. So for those ones that are really not so much, just make the answer very, very concise. So to start okay. with, the first one is, how can I secure admission and scholarship with a 2 to grade? Well, uh, that's possible. I've heard of someone that, that has a 2 to and the person is, is in Germany. Uh, we have so many 2 to in... <clears throat> You know, in the UK as well, those that want shaving scholarships, and then we have those that also try to do, you know, get through partial funding as well to different parts of the world. Uh, Tutu doesn't mean that all hope have lost. All you have to do is you have to just build yourself and build a profile, like we've discussed about research opportunity. All what we've discussed. It's not limited to first class. I just mentioned that of first class for you know, MPhil in Australia. Mm -hmm. Even there are many tutus that they are far better than some first class. And that's why some professors don't consider grade. The first thing they consider is not grade, you know. So it's very possible all hope is not lost. The person just needs to you know, build himself or herself. Oh, okay, good. So in summary, the person just have to uh, build uh, a good profile it's in profile. terms of CV, yes. in terms of involving more in research, yes. volunteering experiences, yes. and yeah. applying as Particularly, well. Also, I think standardized test kind of for yes. some um, institute. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much three things: standardized test yeah, okay. for institutions that will require it. Number two is um, research publication. Then number four is, I mean, number three is uh related experiences you know in relation to the field the person is going so, so that's pretty much what it so always thank needed. you for that thank you so if you're on this um session just uh you made him clearly so i think you can start working on uh, the highlighted point so secondly uh is it possible i get direct phd scholarship after bsc in the us that is very possible us is the is the hot spot for a uh, direct phd you know in us you can see you can see a very youngest person you know a very very young person you know that is almost about rounding up his or phd so you and it's not just now people are just getting to know about it you know i i have even very very more senior senior professors you know that they also went through the same process so it's a it's been a culture for them in, in Australia, uh, some institutions do that, but it's not very common. But the person must have good publication. So if you have quality papers, I mean quality, well indexed, and uh, you know, with good impact factor, uh, we, can, we can look into it. It's, it's also possible, but US is the hot spot for that one. And as well as funding, you know, a lot of funding for US. <laughs> so, US is now US is now stealing everybody, you know, attention. Uh, so US is the first point of contact if you want if you want a direct yeah. PhD scholarship. Direct so PhD. before you look as well, just uh, first of all uh, look in the direction of uh, the United States. Okay, to so the third question is uh, uh, so what are the requirements for master's degree program in Brazil? So this person is asking. Well, this is, this is very Brazil. interesting. So that's why this is very interesting. Well, maybe I should seize this opportunity to let people know that people only know about uh, Canada, US, UK, Australia, and the likes. Yeah. But let me shock you, Brazilian institutions are not bad at all. They are not bad. Uh, many institutions here, if you check Time Higher's ranking, you see them having higher ranking than even many institutions in the US and in the UK. Yeah. Yes. So they are not bad, and their professors are very vast, you know. So uh, the, the requirements, and also let me say this, education is free in Brazil. Uh, oh, that's the only, really nice. Yes, yeah, the, the, so you don't have to pay tuition, even for those that are looking for self-funded routes. The only issue there is that um, English taught programs are not very common, but uh, based on our own program that we uh, uh, happen to be the first uh, cohort for it, 
uh, the many institutions now are now considering, you know, opting in. So they are really upgrading right now as I'm talking, you know, increasing their scope. And the Federation for Brazilian Institutions, they've even signed, you know, an MOU with uh, our own body to see to it that they encourage more Africans, you know, to come and study in Brazil. And labs are, all, you know, well equipped, trust me. Even my friend that is working in the lab, we, we work in the lab all day or night, you know, no weekend, every wow. day, every day is lab work. So you can imagine. So uh, for the requirements is your BSc, a minimum of two one. Uh, you make contact with institutions for those in, for the programs that they are English taught. You make contact, but uh, if they are English taught, you don't have problem with uh, how do I call this with uh, English tests, you don't have problem because we are, if you come from Nigeria or Anglophone countries, but if it is Portuguese thought program that you want to opt in for, you need to do a Portuguese test. But uh, also they, there are some flexible rules, you know, in my own institution, our own program has some flexibility. The engineering faculty has some flex flexibility. You know, you can even audit courses in other institutions. I audited courses in the Bam in University of Birmingham, you know, at University of Birmingham. So I can tell you the, you know, they, there are some gray areas like that, but the programs are, you know, research intensive. So for instance, part of the requirement, I have to, you know, publish in well referred international papers before I can even do, you know, let's say like the predator of my research alone. So you you can imagine. So for the person that has the question, the person can come in contact with me. You can they might be able to have some talk. And those that have interest, fine. You know, is is a good place. And trust me, you enjoy your time, and you do a quality research. Oh, that's that's, that's, good. Good. that's yeah. good to know. So we also add the uh, contact to the uh, PowerPoint presentation. So so that whichever uh, anyone that needs it will. Uh, surely get that. So uh, to the fourth on the list, we have can uh, thirty percent funding scholarship be enough to cater for first year of graduate school in the US? Thirty percent funding scholarship. <laughs> the the answer is capital no. Capital, you yeah. see, people people say people say it that uh, yeah. When I get there, I will work. When I get there, I will work. <laughs> yeah. hours to work doesn't really you can't get the time to work is not, the time to, even uh, yeah the time to even work the time to even work is not that much 20 hours yeah how many, how many hours do you want to spend and yeah yeah the one that will cater for your bills house yeah. rent alone is is big chunk you know what yeah you need exactly. is not a problem house rent is a problem and you have to pay it if you don't want to sleep under the bridge and exactly you know, and also with the energy but, crisis and so many but, but some people yeah issues, some, some people can economic, some people yeah. can give it a shot yeah sure sure with all those issues and then the economic uh, meltdown that is happening everywhere you know it's not only in nigeria now that we have inflation but there's yeah, inflation yeah. everywhere even in brazil here yes so, it is in, in the west too, it's so. everywhere yes yes it's in the west as well so the for that for this particular person my advice is the person should look for, uh, you know, should be patient and look for more. I remember I told someone that time, the person nearly opting for self-funding, you know, to one institution like that. They will offer you admission and then they will give you like $4,000 US dollars wafer. You go and find the rest, my friend. I told the person, be patient. You can win a scholarship. The person is in US now on a fully funded, you know, scholarship. Oh, so it's sense. possible. So you, the, this person shouldn't, you know, give up. It's possible. Assuming it's fifty percent now for UK, I can still say maybe. Can say yeah, much, and also it's very difficult for you US. Yeah, because sometimes very, you have to provide difficult. your approval. You have to provide uh, the approval fund. Yeah, approval fund to before you can even get people your visa. Do. And at that point, even though people like, do that, oh, you have a people. blue paper. They give you a blue paper, and you're like, oh no, I have a <laughs> Yeah, you understand? Yeah. So it's, um, it's it's not so much uh, advisable if you have it's if you have seventy percent seventy percent might still be. But then even though with seventy or eighty percent, you still have a lot of work to do in terms of getting how you get the rest sure. of the money 
So the health insurance is still there. Don't forget yeah, the health, health insurance, insurance is there. <laughs> and you must have health insurance. Yes. You don't even want to afford it. it. Yeah, you don't even want to try that one. And you know so the I, I was on yeah, I was on you know, I was on a Twitter space last weekend, uh the Olu D1 hosted, and uh they were talking about this and the guy said it. He said you want to come to US or self funding. Think well, except you have the money, you know, that is already stocked up somewhere because before you get that say twenty thousand US dollars, and you pay your money, you pay the tuition, you pay it per semester. So you can imagine all the money. Uh, so that's a scholarship is juicy if the person can be patient. Yeah. Or better still look somewhere else. Not it doesn't really have to be only US. Yes. So, of course, if the person if the person can look elsewhere, I guess the person that can get this has minimum of two one. Yeah. Excuse me. So if the person can look elsewhere, even the likes of Finland, Norway, and Europe is not bad. Trust me. And there are many scholarships aside from the almighty Erasmus that is now, you know, the national cake, you know, for Europeans. So you can, you can still get uh, many more. So to the uh, next on our question, uh, we have uh, to the fifth one. I had 3.41. That's a 2 to wow, three. That's close. GPA. Uh, very close. I, I've been writing professor in my field for a couple of times, but with no reply. What am I doing wrong? Or is it because of my grades? Can you advise nah. on what you do? My, my, my advice, my advice for this person, this person can get to US, you know, on a funded basis. And with this 3.41, if the person do worse evaluation, it might push the person, particularly only if the person's final, the last two year, you know, the result for the last two year, the concluding year of his program has a very good grade. We have some people that they started poor, but then they push it, you know, and they end up at the border borderline. So for such kind of person, uh, people rather, you you can, if you do a evaluation, this can be improved a little. But even with this, if the person can write, you know, the, um, test exams, and then the person can also get evidence in writing. But talk of the code mailing. The code mailing is not the CGPA that is the problem. Only if you indicate your CGPA in your, in your CV. If you do not indicate your CGPA in your CV, the professor will not see your CGPA. You, I don't know if you get my point. Yes, what yes, you do I mean. is this. What you do is this. It's not every time you send code email that you have to send your transcript. You know, I just even get to know, discover that of recent that, you know, it even works better when you don't even send transcript alongside your, your CV for code email. But it means that your CV is well packaged. If your CV is well packaged, you know, the professor would have showed interest, you know, you must have, you know, struck the, the code properly that, oh, yeah, this is possible. Uh, but so for this kind of situation, the person can you know, write test score. If you if you are considering US, I advise write GRE. If you write GRE, you get, you get funding, you know, even direct PhD in some institutions. Some of them can still get a good SOP, you know, master's worst case, good SOP, gigantic GRE score, I mean, massive one. You can score like 310 now and you have applied to some school in the south side, you know, and you won't get a funding. It's, it's, it's very rare. Even worst case scenario, you look towards the up north, you will get, because there are some institutions that some people will not you know, look towards. So you just need, and then another thing there is, is the person's course engineering, or it's not engineering, but those of us in the engineering field, you know, we have our own issues. Trust me, you already know. You have no choice. Also, the competition is very, very high. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's just competition. like you are going in the medical. It's just like you are going in the medical line. So that's just it. But the response to the email, the person should check his email template, and then check again those two things. Is the pers is the CGPA there in the in the CV? If it is not there, fine. Then, if it is not there, then maybe something else is wrong. But it's not bad if the person package himself, or the person could look into getting one or two publication, but not through those quack means that we are now hearing on LinkedIn. Please, don't get publication by put my name inside. When you have a publication, you should be able. Professors, we even check what is 
And during the interview, they will stylishly ask you, you can hear what scholar Abdullah said. They will mm. ask you, you know, what has this particular result, this particular paper you publish, what does, you know, what is the uniqueness of this particular work? So, so that's how it goes. It's happened, even people with high score, first class, you know, 10, 15 publications, they don't even get feedback sometimes. So it's not about the grade. It's about endurance and sending the email at the right time. Hmm. So generally, it's advisable you send the email around 9 a.m., working hard, you know, and don't send it on weekend. Hmm. Also, okay, uh, thanks for uh, the response. So to the next, we have... Uh, so this person is asking that getting letters of reference have been difficult, especially for the fact that I don't have access to my undergraduate lecturers for a long time. So apparently this person has left school for quite in, in quite some time. So the person is now saying, can I use letter of reference from a professor who is not specialized in my field and also who is not from my undergraduate school? Is it possible? Mm. This, is, this is tricky. Our advice, no matter what, even if the person have left school 20 years ago, the person can still trace the school back, except the school is closed up. And then if the school is still open, you can still... The best thing you do, just walk up to whoever that is now the head of the department or one or two of those professors that you know. Even if the person has retired, you can still approach the professor that... the retired professor that, sir, uh, if you remember, you taught me so, 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 I want to do this, you know, or you approach the head of department, you talk to the person. I'm a graduate of your department for a so-so period. For this kind of person will have experience, you know, working experience. So, you know, the person will have at least a fair profile. So it's still not bad, but using a professor that is not in your field is in two ways. If the professor's field, for instance, is in ICT, and you're applying for a position or a, a, a program that is AI related or machine learning related. And that professor that did not even teach you, you know, is working in that field. But the professor knows you very well and can attest to your progress, then you can still use such person. I don't know if you get my explanation. Yes, my yes. explanation is clear. So one can still use such person, but it's advisable you use at least someone that has the essence of referee of recommendation letter or referee is that the person should be able to attest to your you know to your pros your capability that yes this person is is capable so those who even have direct contacts they are still having issues you know you get a referee that we submit a you know very shallow recommendation letter why is good, that, why is good? <laughs> you know trust me and the talk of recommendation letter, there are even a lot of issues on that one. Even there are some people that they will even ask you, send me a template of your, a draft copy of your recommendation letter. And then you'll be writing some personal information that is not even expected that your professor will know about you, you know, in the recommendation letter. And, you know, it's, it's really funny sometimes, but this kind of situation, the person can still get it, you know. The person should just look wide at least on a broad spectrum if okay to the next way. yeah so sorry um, so to the next we have please is it possible to enroll for master scholarship program in agricultural engineering without a certificate in agriculture that is without pdg and also my first degree was in mathematics and education wow so i think it's engineering changes also is it possible to enroll for a master scholarship in a Greek engineering yes. without a certification in agriculture? Well, yes. generally, generally, I don't think certification, uh, gaining access to engineering field requires certification. That's number one, except yeah. if the person is in Nigeria. Uh, that's number one. Number two is from mathematics and education. Well, let's say from mathematics and growth, the kind of research the person wants to do, you know, must be uh, uh, also a kind of thing that is very related. You know, it will be at an intercept of a Greek and then mathematics. Let's say pretty much on 
engineering aspect of our Greek you get, and then with an overlap of some tools that is you know useful from mathematics. The reason why I'm saying this is because to fit in is not easy, particularly for scholarship. It's not easy. One way or the other, you must be able to demonstrate it that there is a link somewhere. People cross carpet. People from economics come to you know another field, particularly my field. Everybody comes to my field. Microbiology will come, you know, chemistry will come. So, but for agri engineering, it's still possible if this person can develop the profile. What you have to do is not really the certification, but the other things. What are the other you know, virtual courses that you can take, affiliations with professional bodies, not really for certification, so to say, but just get yourself acquainted with the end thing, get one or two, you know, papers. Uh, th these are the as areas that where publication can help, you know. You as your uh, someone from mathematics background, maybe you are using artificial intelligence or machine learning, and then you talk to somebody that is in a Greek, and then you just do maybe stock market, I mean, one aspect of agric engineering just one aspect is engineering not agricultural science not animal mm. husbandry yes. yeah engineering is engineering is broad and mathematics has a good place in engineering so yes it's possible you know that's what yeah. I'm i think i can also add that uh if the person is also on this call the person can also try to like um um do more of um work in that line in terms of professional experience acquire professional experience probably in the engineering in the agriculture engineering field probably for some years yeah. so you can also use that as a leverage in wanting yeah. to like cross from mathematics and education into engineering yeah. so but then you'll be limited in where to apply and uh, who you can work with but then work with that you have more work to do which is uh, also possible for you so to the next uh, i think we need to be more fast because uh, yes no problem um, um just about 90 minutes left uh so does experience matter on whether i win a scholarship if yes what are what by what share so, so this person wants to know okay if i don't have experience does it doesn't mean i can win a scholarship or if i have experience, experience. Like, is it this is this in two ways experience in terms of scholarship application experience or experience in terms of working experience work experience is not a must there are people there are fresh graduates in fact there are people that they left nyc like this boom, and then and they resume for yeah, and so. then there are some people that did not even go for nyc itself you know <laughs> it depends on how fast your hand you are able to be mentored but talk of experience for applying for scholarship you know uh whether I win, okay, does experience matter on whether I win a scholarship? Yes, yes the person wants to know the experience, yeah. Yeah, for experience in terms of applying for scholarship opportunities is important. You know, I remember I used my SOP for Commonwealth General Scholarship to apply for OKP, you know, and then <laughs> IHE Depth just sends me a nice, well packaged <laughs> love letter. You know, so it happens. I would mean why the other one that I applied using, you know, that I just write based on my undergraduate experience, I was placed on a reserve list. So all those things matter. Experience matter. Uh, you need someone that has an experience to review your essay. You need someone that, but talk of working experience, work experience is not a must at all. At all. All you have to do is what are the other things? especially for fresh graduates fresh graduates is very easy and for those that have graduated over time what you have been doing over that time just you know relate it relate it and if it is not you know well relatable at all then you can still find a way you can silence on those ones in your sop and build on other ones your passion for education is what is still driving you that make you to apply for application for scholarship not that you are tired of only your situation. So yes. it's possible. And also, the person should also know, okay, which scholarship or 
program to apply so for it's, because exactly. there are some program they put emphasis on your professional experience there are some they put emphasis on your research experience there are some that yes. they don't need any of the two they just need a very good grade probably you finish from your first class a very strong for class first class just come and so you need to know where you want to fit in if you are the guy exactly. that is finishing or a lady just finished from university and you have a very fantastic US is, and you know that US yes for you. you do quite a number of things during your undergraduate race you don't need the research even you know you have very limited research but you have a very good transcript that can speak for you then you can easily apply to some schools in the u.s and get a fully funded offer and the last even, of the like, last if you've left well. school for quite some time and probably you have four or five years experience there are some scholarships oh, that are for you so well. <laughs> they are shaving scholarship for you and... that they just want to like the 32 four years experience and the life years of swedish experience scholarship as well you have if there are so many of them so boy if it's like you have a research ex, just research experience aside from your academia and probably your academic is not so good then you can also you, there are also other offers like other offers. some ca that you can also fit in so just know where to key in so to the next one we have what are the tips for preparing for interview with perspective here so this has already been answered during the session That's so we don't need to say anything true. about that so to the next are there possible means one can gain scholarship without i health tofu and um jerry very very there are plenty means you don't so, need i lts to win the likes of commonwealth the likes of erasmus the likes of singa the likes of um Chinese government scholarship, you know, yes. HKPFS, yeah. you don't need scholar. Even in US, there are many schools that, depending on program, you know, but if you're in the engineering field, it might be difficult to, <laughs> but... In fact, know, like, but, even though you're in the engineering field, there are some even, that I know quite a number yeah, of people are zoomed now. Yeah, there are. They never wrote any of these exams and they are in the engineering field. So it's... Yeah, does, there are so some, you there just are need some. to know where to apply to. It's not like you see a school that wants you to write GRE and TOEFL and say, okay, because some schools don't want, so you apply to, to those, want, those schools that want you to write those exams. So you just need to know, okay, are they waiving GRE and TOEFL for my department? So if they are waiving it, so you have little or nothing to worry about, you just need to focus on other part of your application. You understand? But yeah. it's always good if you can write them. But if you don't, it's not really a big deal because you can always it's get fine. fully funded offers in other places and another thing instead of the IELTS and TOEFL there uh, you can always get uh the English language certificate from your university which can replace some of uh this standard exam for your application just to show that okay you were also taught in English language so that's uh that, so so the next one how can I become a member of this organization yeah. so this is by uh, uh, um scholar of life I'm sorry but you can always much. get you can always they get, can google for it you will share his contact so and his email yeah so they can they can they can also they can also filter for the organizations there are some of the organizations that you know their information the is available or, online or, and, you know, so you can make contact yeah, so, so what can i that. do uh to get admitted in mississippi <laughs> university with fully funded offer we've apply. also said everything already like apply so it's not limited you to Mississippi. Need to apply and to apply you need you need to know the requirements and to re to know the requirements to know how to fit in well you, you just need to uh, yeah. listen to everything we've said earlier and um just put those things together link them together in terms of your cv the requirements for admission emailing a professor if need be and uh, you can always get fully funded offer yeah so how can undergraduate students win fully funded scholarship in the field of art and humanities prof a lot uh for this one they can win and there are erasmus programs that you know appreciates art and humanities uh there are direct scholarship as well that people also win uh, so there are scholarships for art and humanities even though it's not as common as uh, when we talk about STEM, that is like pure water, you know. Uh, so uh, it's available. At least I have a friend that is doing his PhD in uh, in English or something, and he's in Hong Kong. You know, the likes of Scholar Oeka, you know, he's a lecturer in, in, of English in at the Department of English as well in the Nigerian yeah, University. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's advisable. I mean, it's uh, it's uh, obtainable. One can get it. But when we say undergraduate students. 
Are you talking about 200 or 300 level undergraduate <laughs> students? You know, and if it is for undergraduate scholarship, the person can look into the likes of MasterCard. Uh, I think Korean government scholarship has undergraduate, like, right? Yes, I have MasterCard, for, yeah, they do, they do. Yeah, MasterCard has, uh, there are many other scholarships that they have. Education USA has programs. Yeah, they, are, they also are for uh, those that want to go to the US, but then, for, you know, for, you need for, stats and yeah. so <laughs> Yeah, you need stats, and then you your 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 YEC results must be very good. In fact, before very you are selected, like you have to be very good grades. So, like, so all those things, but the person should just check for those art and humanities. If the person search, but if it is for postgraduate masters, the person can get as well. They are very much available. Check Outspot ISF. Check uh, Opportunity Corners. Check um, uh, the likes of these websites. Uh, how do I call this? I mean, what was the name of this? Opportunity for Africa. There are many of them, scholarship positions. There yeah, are many it, of them. Yes, yes. I yes, think we've yes. also said that before in some of the previous webinars. We shared yes. the links to yeah. get all these opportunities. Yeah, they'll so get on not, the scholarship. You just check uh, the past uh, webinars and you always find uh, something there. And uh, on the 14th question, is there age limit for admission mm -hmm. or scholarship position? Because I am above 40, but still want to finish my PhD, which I abandoned so many years ago due to lack of fun. So this person is over 40 years, so he, mm -hmm. he wants to know if it's still possible, because he's over 40, is it possible for him to still get a PhD offer and um, and an admission? Okay. The, the, issue of, the issue of age limit is a gray area, but it's very common to those that are applying to government-funded programs like the likes okay. of Tokiye, the likes of Tokiye scholarship, uh, the likes of I think I think Chinese government scholarship has age cap, right? Maybe thirty five or something. I think uh, yeah, there are some it. there there are some there are some scholarship that they have age cap, but talk of getting an opportunity in Canada, US, UK. I mean Australia. You can get the, those ones they don't care about your age all they care about is what you have to offer you know exactly it's, it's, it's very really interesting mm, exactly. it's very very nice it's very very nice and very okay so so you know the person can look into it age is not a barrier age doesn't mean that the, in fact the, the fact that the person is old and the person has ventured into phd before you know, it's also a story that the person could also tell, you know, and you can link it with other excuses, I mean, other reasons, not excuses, other reasons why you have to leave the program, at least for someone like me, uh, I, you know, I applied while I was on, on my first program in Nigeria, and I stated my reasons, the research I wanted to do, I can't do it because the facilities are not available here, and because the, the research happened as of that time, the research was hot cake and before i knew it that year alone people started publishing in that field and up to now it's still a serious problem you know because there's still no regulation for it up to date and people are dying daily as a result of the consequences from that problem so so it's advisable that this person should pursue it the person should just write a very very good and impressive sop the person can get it Trust yeah, me. I think of recent too, there's also a man that also won Erasmus and I think he's over 40, having done like master's, PhD. Uh, yeah, there's someone that did PhD. Uh, PhD and, then he applied for Erasmus, master's again, and he's already <laughs> over 40. So if he can yeah. do it, then so there's nothing to it's all about. It's all about the your interest and uh, your dedication. You're okay. How committed are you in getting this opportunity? Yeah. So, so to the next one, can I apply to PhD program without securing a supervisor? I think this should just be yeah. It's, it's possible. It's, it's possible. The person can apply. Yeah, I want but, to apply uh, a PhD program at Harvard, <laughs> Biological Science in Public Health. Yeah. However, I have not had any lab experiences. I graduated from medical school, and having <laughs> lab experience is one of the criteria I've considered for the program. What are my chances? <laughs> As regards to that requirement, I tick all the boxes. I think you've answered your question. <laughs> this person <laughs> needs to be sincere with you. Know, so. you did not tick all. You did not tick all boxes. <laughs> the lab experience. <laughs> the lab experience is one of the boxes, and you did yeah, not tick. So, there's no, so you yourself, you already out. said yourself. It's My advice for this person is: look somewhere else. How about yeah. 
biological science yeah. is not a being. It's like a, I said, yeah, even John Hopkins himself, he's not a being. Yeah, exactly. Trust me. You know, exactly. I, just I mean, somewhere you else in in all your resources, every other thing you have, where you are as a medical practitioner, Except, you don't know where. Yeah. Just put Except. them in that field and just apply it. Yeah. You don't have to be in yeah. that bad. Like, you, yeah. John Hopkins, there are so Except, many. Good, uh, Except, yes, only on one occasion. Except if the person knows it that he doesn't, he or she doesn't want any other thing else aside Harvard, then I will advise the person should find me to get lab experience. Lab experience. If you are in Nigeria, if you are in Nigeria, you can do housemanship or internship or whatever you know you want to do. Get a lab, even if it is a private lab, government uh, lab. Find a place to hook yourself up with before you spend a year and a half there. You know, by the time you are applying again, you know, you would have had something yeah, to showcase. Maybe, Since you said you tick all other boxes. So yeah, I would not be pe experience. pessimistic on this. We are not discouraging the person, but my That's own advice true. is if the person wants to, if the person wants to apply this round of application that is out, you know, the person should apply beyond Harvard, except if the person knows that he or she doesn't want anywhere elsewhere aside Harvard. That's fine. You know, so because in this race, you have to also be very flexible. There are some people who yeah, have absolutely. over five, ten years experience, and they won't be selected. So it's not really. Sometimes you might have the experience, not, have it, but then limited slots, and you answer. just have to go with like the best of the best of the best of the best. And you're like, yes, and you just have like two, three years of work experience in a lab experience. Why so? You don't even have publication, like or you have experience. one or two. Yeah, and so you know, not to and you like, see someone that is even a lecturer and he's going for that in, PhD, that same position. <laughs> so sometimes it's not really that you are not qualified, but then the space you have, there are limited space, and um, there are so many people applying also. So you might need to, like, okay, be flexible, apply to many places, then. With your quality application, you can always get into one place. Then probably for your higher degrees, you can go to Harvard. You can go to Harvard. In fact, for your postdoctor, if you have your PhD in a in a very good uh, university, also in the US. of course, so it's, it's, of it's course. a very good. It's not uh, most even in the US. You can say Harvard or no. I think that uh, that should help. To the okay, to the uh, next few questions we have. Okay, How can I authorize my official transcript when my university doesn't release official one to students? Well, let me clarify this. Official transcript is different from student statement of results. Official transcript becomes unofficial when you have it with yourself. I mean, to yourself, when it is given to you like this. The original transcript, when it is given to you, it becomes unofficial. But when it is prepared, stamped, and sealed, and sent directly to the institution, that is when it is, you know, official, official transcripts directly from the institution. So maybe what the person, maybe so that it will not be like the person has the transcript. Though some some schools usually do student copy, you know. My school for PG program, they will do student copy. They will give you one draft copy like that. So that one also is different. But if you have the transcript that is given to you, you can notarize it. When you notarize it, it's, you know, it's binding, at least it's approved. And notarization is in different forms. It, you know, it, some will say it has to be Ministry of Education and Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And some will say it has to be Notary Republic. And some, even some embassies, you know, they have designated individuals, notary that they can notarize. Anybody outside those ones, you can notarize through them, you know. So, so I just hope the person I've gotten was the difference between because I, it's a question I keep saying every now and then that, okay, official transcript, unofficial transcript. I hope uh, it's well understood now. Yeah, your transcript is your transcript. So, you should not. Uh, uh, take that away. Okay, what gives one an edge in securing admission in the US? I think this has been explained earlier in terms of all your requirements, all the requirements, meeting all the requirements. In fact, once you have to meet all the requirements and you need to stop submit a stellar application. Um, is it advisable to indicate graduate assistantship as the means of paying tuition? 
you don't need to say that you are paying tuition. You will just mention it in your SOP. You are applying for, you will be glad to be considered for with graduate, as, I mean, for admission with graduate assistantship. They already know, especially if you are an international student. For program, they already expect you as a graduate program that you should be funded, except if you tell them, I don't need your money, keep your money, you know, I have my own money that I'm bringing. My father is Aliko Dangote, you know, then <laughs> you are fine. But when, once you mention it, you don't even need to mention tuition. Once they give you assistantship, assistantship means we are assisting you. So, so that we will not assist you and collect the money back from you. So we we'll waive your tuition. That's how it goes. And also during your application, there's always um, some university have a such that in your application that they ask you to tick of, okay, if you if you are willing to accept um, TA position, RA position, then that's fine. You can always mark them if you want TA, RA, fellowship, if it's available, if you meet up with, uh, if your profile is so good that you meet up, they, they will always give you in the admission mail. In the scholarship, they will tell you, okay, you've been awarded and uh, you'll be given an admission and you have been given an RA position or a TA, so it will be specified. So sometimes, and yeah. if you have interest in it, you can also make contact to professors and um, they can give you RA in their uh, department, then you can use that. That can be used uh, as a means of funding um, your, um, your studies. So just need to... Yeah pay attention to the details of the application process. Uh, so how do I navigate scholarship in Brazil? If you have questions, you can always mail to mail prof. <laughs> so his contact will be attached to the um, um, to the PowerPoint so you can get his contact at me for more um, answers. Um, which search engine can I use to search professors who are open to receive students for master's and PhD in their lab? I believe we've talked about this. This and just we've talked about several several ones. Websites, sources, the university website. I think um, um even, also even, talked about it and some uh, where you can also get some of all this information. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also I in Canada, I think there's this um there's this funding organization which they are also um, get funding. NSEC. Yeah, and so they also but, they also some but I don't know. I don't know. I know NSEC is very top notch, but I don't know if people are if uh immigrants can easily access NSEC. I really yeah. don't know. You know, I know they are so, different, they are, they are different and um different they are, they are in many the US too. They are also in the US, but I think most of them are always like directly connected to the government because the university submit an in the UK the they approve then these uh the professors then recruit students into their yes. labs to do the project then yes. the in the in the uk in the uk there are there are schools that they fund research based program like mfu uh, the likes of lancaster university is uh Borough, and many other more most schools what they do is uh, you work for industry is industry research focus so you have already have an industry that you have in target. You apply to them. If they accept you for environmental sciences, I know for Lancaster has like three different routes, three different or four different funding bodies that you can explore. The, but the funding is what I can guarantee that is enough. You know, I yeah, can guarantee limited. that the funding yeah, is limited. enough. And another issue there is most of the such opportunities, they consider UK citizen fair and Europeans first before international students. So mm -hmm. that's the problem there. But for Australia, schools like Cotton University, uh, if your course is there, you can send, you can set up a, a reminder, email, an email notification. The university will automatically send you email when there is a research-based program, I mean, uh, advert. I receive their email every now and then. You set it based on your field, your preference. So they will mail you. Oh, you know, this uh, opportunity is open. And then you see it, you see the requirements, you contact the professor. So, so many schools, it's all about searching. If you don't search, you can get. So like you also had search engines, so consult, <laughs> search through so many search engines. So you can always, you always get information. To so to the next question, any alternative to voice evaluation? The alternative is find the best route for you. Mm -hmm. Voice so, evaluation is not a must. 
it's not a must yeah so you need to know that there are know. millions of there are millions of people that they have graduated millions that they are currently in school millions that they will still go and they will not do west evaluation yeah, yeah, if the school is demanding for west evaluation and you don't have the money don't waste your money particularly when you don't have particularly when you don't have a professor in that school and a professor is required don't waste your money except when you know you have the money when you don't have the money west evaluation is it's a fortune it costs a fortune yeah it's you know, about just, 208 dollars now and you convert that to nigeria <laughs> Naira, it's, that's just for the west that's when your school is not even sending it where yeah for your school to send, send it Directly yeah, because they have to copy. receive it directly from the yeah, university. like my institution now, I think it's about maybe fifty thousand that they send it now. Imagine you that know, uh, international transcript, soft copy, not uh, not the hard copy. It's even soft, soft. It's not even hard copy. Imagine just to send an email over fifty k. So <laughs> generally, generally, I don't advise people to opt in for a program that require for official transcript from inception. When you have been admitted, you know that you have been offered admission. And uh -huh, you can send official transcripts. That time you know I'm spending this money, but at least I'm getting it. But when it's not sure at all for you, and then you've started spending, spending, spending. By the time the love letter comes, you know, the rejection, you'll not be able to easily, you know, accommodate it. Is, it's uh, available, except you know, except if the person has some preferences. You know, for those so, things, but, so this next okay. question is similar to what we've answered before. Is there any website that shows list of rest of the grants? That there are lots. There are lots. We've already answered that. As a as a graduate of microbiology, who wants to go into medicine, how can I go about it with my first degree in microbiology? <laughs> you need to be careful. It depends on medicine. You said medicine. When you say medicine. You check the requirement. So I'm not used to medicine, but from Nigeria self, I know that in Nigeria, if you have a degree in microbiology and you go to medicine, they will send you back to 100 or 200 level. You can't go beyond 200 level. Mm -hmm. Even if the best graduate students at uh, from FUNAB, that was in 20, that should be 2016. The guy finished as the best in his set. It was a first class, a big one. And he opted in for medicine program and he's doing his medicine now, but he had to start from I think maybe 100 or 200 level mm -hmm. because medicine is a, is a different field, it's not microbiology, right. you know, it's not like all the other, all other STEM field that you can just easily opt in. If you say public health, it's fine, but for medicine, medicine, we are talking about accuracy level of. You know, 99.9%. Yes, yes, you want to put everything into it. You have to put everything and you have to tick all the boxes. <laughs> yeah, Their certification is not anyhow. Yes, <laughs> they don't want you to inject people anyhow, you know. And yeah. so, so, so for this person, check the requirements. If you meet up, fine, you can go. But always so, check. So the next, we have a professor recommend I should apply to their program for next four. Is it enough for me to consider? for me to consider she has accepted me i don't think so <laughs> <laughs> he's not able enough. even it's possible it's possible you know it has it happened to me in the last uh, round of application you know i already gained admission to to the school i already have contact with this professor i already contact the graduate coordinator it was graduate coordinator i knew first now I recommend the professor to me that i should contact the professor you know I contacted the professor, did interview like three times, you know, we're on good face, but I couldn't get funding, you know, so it is never a must until you get the funding. If you have yet to get the letter, until the letter gets to your hand, it's not certain. So I yeah. still have another professor and another professor and another professor. Yeah, exactly. So that's, you know, exactly. that's the best way. Exactly. So the last three questions are how many days can a prospective student send a follow-up mail to potential um supervisor? i think i mentioned I this I, I i okay that that interviewed him or her yeah so oh like a reminder is, email if you don't the, get the ethics the ethics is this the ethics is this after your first interview with the professor if you see that the professor shows some interest even if the professor did not show some interest send an email maybe the, the day after appreciate the professor for his time and put a tip there you know mm. you look forward to joining this, this lab soon uh, you know feedback. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, you're expecting feedback or if the person has asked you to apply put it there 
Then after some time, you can make it depends. You see, some some professor you will know if they respond fast, then that means you can mail the person often. But if the person is the type that when you mail now, maybe after two days, the person will respond. You know, see this issue of professor responding to email. It's not a thing of maybe because you are not good. Even the professor that is not supervising you, that is not begging him for email or for anything. A prof that taught me one of my courses, I mailed him like five times before he responded once. Mm -hmm. so, so, so it's, it's an habit for some of them. They are not even used to it. They are not even yeah. used to it. So, so don't feel bad, but send an email, send a reminder. It's not bad. A two weeks interval is not bad. Two weeks all. interval. That's, that's but interesting. if you don't have anything, any tangible thing to say, it's better you don't talk. Just saying, and just expect feedback from him. Yeah. So to the next one, I did um fully funded scholarship for physically challenged students. Ah, there are many. There are many. Yes, Chevinin is there their many. Mastercard. There are so many. There are so many. Even 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 research positions of yeah, so research many. positions. There are many. Yeah, so many, what and there are about? also spaces for them too. In probably in, in institutions yeah, marginalized company, because you always yeah. they always have a proportion that you, for every company you should have, and if uh, if if you are in that um, category, then you can always apply, and you should not be limited. There are there are there are lots there should are lots there are lots. I know Mastercard and Chevron very well for those two things. Like you, in fact, it's easier very, to get self. It's easier to get. Physically so challenge. They just get good. Specific, uh, just get your story together. And yeah, just get just yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, inside of uh, the story, convey in a very. There is preference story. for those ones. Uh, very, there are preference for those people. What are the major ingredients needed to be transferred from your old project to form an article in a situation where you want to convert your thesis to an article? So this person is asking Ooh. about converting thesis to an article. Well, um. Though I, I once uh, had a lecture on this, the, the thing there is that the person needs to first know, it depends on the kind of thesis, is it graduate or, or uh, postgraduate thesis or a, an undergraduate project. The reason why I said so is because the extent of the work, you know, the, the scope of the work also matters, but be that with, uh, no matter what, is possible and the scope is that the major ingredients is that the person should know that the result is what is the most useful part of the thesis the result if you know you did due diligence in your re literature review in fact your literature review alone should be a paper on its own for graduate students your literature review is a paper on its own because your literature review must have been able to analyze and identify you know highlighting series of you know, flaws or gaps that you can deal with or that your proposed project is about to deal with. So that one alone, you can package it, you know, get it, uh, you know, prepared for them. But talk of the ingredients you need. If you know that maybe you've graduated over from some time, repackage the work, get the results extracted first. The title of your thesis is not going to be the title of your paper. You know, maybe if we can, if we can have the privilege for you know a, a, a detailed discussion on how to convert you know and uh, your thesis to a full research uh, paper is different because there are so many things to consider. But the summary is this: your results should be extracted, form the result. The basic of all these things is form the uh, tables and figures, and then write the methodology write the results then, rewrite the introduction in the format of a publication. In publication, there are four key ingredients that are embedded in, in the introduction. The number one of it is the problem statement that you will present, you know, a brief literature review embedded in it in form of that problem that you are presenting, you know, justification and significance of your study embedded in it, and then you, you cap it up with the objective of your study. So that is what makes up a, an introduction of any quality publication, not shallow pu publication, but we are talking about a quality publication. So those are the ingredients. And then afterward, thank you very much. Bro. And thank, you. thank you very together. much. Bro. 
So to this yes. last question that, that we have, this is actually from the YouTube channel, please kindly enlighten me on overrating one's uh, self in CV or SOP. This person asking about overrating. Well, talk of overrating is very straightforward. Don't write what you know you can't do. Don't highlight it in your CV. You don't know how to use GCMS, GCMS as a as a someone as someone coming from chemistry, you know. Don't write it that you know how to use it. So that when you get to that lab, you know, you not go and fumble. See, it's expected when you join the lab for those that will be working in the laboratory. When you join the lab, they will put you through everything, they will teach you. The reason is because the procedure for those who are in the experimental aspect field. They will tell you the procedure one lab uses is different from the procedure the other lab is using. So when that professor brings you to his lab, he will introduce you to other graduate students. You will see people that are ahead of you. It can even be an undergraduate student that will teach you certain things. Trust me, the purpose is to learn. Okay. Uh, Dr. Mui Wai Balajobi said it. And, yeah. you know, and yeah, then the only other thing I want to say is uh, I observed and so that it will not be as if we did not capture the aspect of the those who are interested in postdoctoral research. Yeah. The similar thing applies for some for most postdoctoral position. All you have to do is package yourself and contacts. But the issue of instrumentation also is another issue that most postdoctoral people that are interested in postdoctoral research from Africa, you know, Nigeria in particular, do face. So my own advice is if they can get a lab to hook up with a private firm, a private lab that we do you know one analysis or the other just tell them you want to have a, a time to just survey and voluntary for one month or two months or three months before i tried left nigeria that was the decision i made i made contact with different labs that oh i want to come and learn how to operate this equipment though unfortunately i could not do that but at least i made the move and when i got here the first thing i did also fix myself up with lab and get myself busy with lab work just be learning and learning and learning. The reason is you just have to do it since it's your yeah. field. It's very possible. All right. Thank you very much for the ex uh, for the explanation. It's uh, really uh, an interesting one. And um, in fact, you really we really learned a lot from you. And uh, also our second speaker, person of uh, Abdullah. Uh, we really want to appreciate you also. And also thanks uh, to all our viewers too that joined through our uh, the platforms through hisf platforms through all the uh, media and uh, we want to say thanks for joining this session and uh, we hope to see you in our next session so the the um the poster should be out in a couple of days for the next session which you always find and uh, we hope we hope you make good use of, uh, of the contents and um, also if you have any questions any feedback just uh Put it on the comment section on the YouTube. We will always be willing to uh, answer your questions. The admin of the group will always be willing to answer your questions. So, the next time, I'm Kenny Disa. Thank Lamin. you very much. Oh, Prof, thank you very much for. Thank having, you very much for the for, for having me. Sir. For everyone that have joined, we also appreciate you for taking your time and your resources to be part of the session. Really appreciate you. And we hope to hope you've learned uh, one or two things because every time you join Essential, you always want to learn one addition. And so we hope that you've been able to um, learn to your um, to, to your portfolio. So thank you very much again and see you uh, some other time. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye for now.